body. That is now the second category of the mind, body and spirit. Um, I have some videos on, on my website on the plant-based diet. Um, I'm not going to, to get into that now because we don't have enough time. But okay, what I learned in, in, in at the lifestyle center where I did my um, lifestyle counseling qualification, um, I don't know if you've heard of the New Start program. It was developed by the Weimar Institute of Health and Education in California. And basically, the New Start acronym stands for nutrition, exercise, water, sunshine, temperance, air, rest, and trust in God. And this is a very effective program that may have helped many people to recover from, from various um, illnesses such as diabetes and cancer and so on. And it's also very effective for mental health. So the N for nutrition, I'm only going to, to mention a few things there. Um, I believe that the, the plant-based diet is the healthiest diet to, to be on when you want to recover from any illness, from mental illness or physical illness. But you can go and have a look at the videos for that one. But I do want to mention that you must also be careful and be aware of um, food intolerances such as gluten intolerance or some people struggle with grains or nuts or so on because um, a food intolerance can, can cause inflammation in the body and also in the brain. And there's this article um, called Is Gluten Killing Your Brain by Chris Kresser from the Kresser Institute. And he says, I'm just quoting a short piece. The whole um, article is also on my website. He says, neuroinflammation has been associated with depression and anxiety, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, ADHD, and an increased vulnerability to neurodegenerative disease. Therefore, non-celiac gluten sensitivity may be an underlying cause of neuroinflammation, which is inflammation in the brain, um, gradually altering the normal and healthy functioning of the brain and leading to manifestations of mental health problems and neurological disease. I found out that I was gluten intolerant about, I think, three years ago. And I went on a gluten-free diet and a lot of my symptoms have improved since I stopped eating gluten. I'm not saying that gluten is bad for everybody. It, it depends whether you are intolerant to gluten or not. Um, then another important thing um, for if you want to recover from mental illness is to get enough proteins. Um, I'm using a supplement, a plant-based protein supplement that works really well for me. It's called uh, Vivo Life Whole Plant-Based Nutritional Shake. Um, and the next point that I want to that I want to talk about is carbohydrates. So the the brain is dependent on glucose. It needs glucose to function properly, and if it doesn't get a proper supply of, of glucose, it can lead to hypoglycemia. And symptoms of hypoglycemia can include depression, insomnia, anxiety, irritability, crying spells, forgetfulness, confusion, mood swings, aggression, sugar addiction, lack of self-control, substance addiction, alcoholism, mental confusion, concentration problems, and learning difficulties. Whole grains provide a steady supply of glucose. Avoid refined sugar and refined grains such as white flour or white rice. Um, and also another important point is that um, grains, nuts, seeds and legumes contain um, anti-nutrients such as phytates and lectins and enzyme inhibitors. And you can neutralize or, or get rid of these, not all of them, but you can reduce the amount of phytates and lectins and enzyme inhibitors uh, by soaking the grains, legumes, nuts and, nuts and seeds. They call it activation. Also, be aware that some sprouts are toxic. For example, um, you can't eat uh, red, ki red kidney bean sprouts. And I also believe that sorghum sprouts are not edible. I'm not sure on that one, though. Because I only saw one article on it. So 
do some research before you sprout um, your grains and, and legumes. Then fats, um, essential fatty acids need to be obtained through the diet. Um, inflammation can be caused by an incorrect ratio between omega-3 and omega-6. So the correct ratio is two parts omega-3 to one part omega-6. And the problem with our modern diet is that um, all these oils, the like sunflower oil, are very high in omega-6, so it can cause inflammation. It's better to, to use natural fats like um, avocado and coconut and nuts and to minimize the amount of oil, cooking oil that you use and to rather stick to cold pressed oils such as um, extra virgin olive oil and virgin coconut oil and also minimize frying with oil. I've actually learned to fry with water and it's not actually bad when you get used to it. Okay, then um, vitamins and minerals, make sure that you have enough of the right, the correct vitamins and minerals such as B vitamins and magnesium, vitamin C, vitamin D. Um, the Vivo Life whole plant-based nutritional shake that I'm using uh, works really well for me. I've felt the difference in my anxiety. I'm not promoting any products. I'm just mentioning what has helped me. Um, acid and alkaline. Your body needs to be slightly alkaline. And so avoid um, things like vinegar and mustard and ketchup and chutney and all those sources with vinegar, sugar, artificial sweeteners, um, unhealthy fats, fizzy drinks, coffee, black tea, green, green tea, chocolate, ready-made meals, pastries, white flour, sugar, alcohol, nicotine, stress, anxiety, constipation, and lack of sleep. All those things can cause acidity in the body. And animal products and animal proteins are also acidic. Meat, fish, dairy, and eggs. Then gut health is very important for mental health because the gut can affect the brain. For example, if you have inflammation in the gut, it can actually go to the brain. But there's a, a whole video on that on my website called Digestion and Colon Care by Jeannie Davis. Then food and beverage additives that affect mental health. I'm going to read a few quotes. Um, I, think, I think this is quite important because people aren't aware that food additives can, can affect mental health. The first article that I want to read from uh, is about caffeine. It's Neuropsychiatric Effects of Caffeine, published by Cambridge University Press. Stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system by caffeine puts the body in fight or flight mode. In psychiatric inpatients who can neither fight nor flee, sympathetic arousal will produce excitement and anxiety, which may result in behavioral disturbance. In a study of long-stay psychiatric inpatients, Switching to decaffeinated coffee for three weeks led to an improvement in anxiety, irritability, and hostility, which was reversed when caffeine was reintroduced. Reintroduction of caffeine also caused an increase in psychotic features. Cocoa, chocolate. Is raw cacao or dark chocolate really healthy? By Cynthia Perkins, MED. Raw cacao contains over 300 naturally occurring chemicals and many of them are detrimental to the human body and mind when consumed on a regular basis. Raw cacao stimulates high levels of serotonin, endorphins and dopamine, three crucial neurotransmitters involved in regulating mood, pain, sleep and appetite and the cycle of addiction. Overstimulating or mimicking of neurotransmitters causes the brain to cut back on production as it is tricked into thinking it has too many and this leads to depletion and of neurotransmitters and tolerance. Many of these chemicals are also overstimulating to the autonomic nervous system and thrust the body into a fight or flight, into a state of fight or flight. All this impact on neurotransmitters and the autonomic nervous system has a detrimental impact on the adrenal glands because they cause overstimulation to this organ as well. Over time, as the adrenal, adrenal glands are called upon continuously to release these hormones, they burn out. They no longer produce cortisol as they should, which leads to adrenal fatigue and eventually exhaustion. 
Adrenal fatigue or exhaustion leads to many chronic health conditions and symptoms like excessive fatigue, inability to handle stress, anxiety, depression, and many more. Refined sugar. I'm reading from the article, Dietary Sugar and Mental Illness, A Surprising Link by Stephen Elardi, PhD. <clears throat> Noted British psychiatric researcher Malcolm Peake has conducted a provocative cross-cultural analysis of the relationship between diet and mental illness. His primary finding may surprise you, a strong link between high sugar consumption and the risk of both depression and schizophrenia. In fact, there are two potential mechanisms through which refined sugar intake could exert a toxic effect on mental health. First, sugar actually suppresses activity of a key growth hormone in the brain called BDNF. This hormone promotes the health and maintenance of neurons in the brain, and it plays a vital role in memory function by triggering the growth of new connections between neurons. BDNF levels are critically low in both depression and schizophrenia, which explains why both syndromes often lead to shrinkage of key brain regions over time. <clears throat> Second, sugar consumption triggers a cascade of chemical reactions in the body that promote chronic inflammation. Now, under certain circumstances, like when your body needs to heal a bug bite, a little inflammation can be a good thing since it can increase activity and blood flow to a wound. But in the long term, inflammation is a big problem. It dis disrupts the normal functioning of the immune system and wreaks havoc on the brain. <coughs> Sweetness. So there are many different um, artificial sweeteners, but I'm only going to uh, quote on one of them, which is aspartame. Aspartame and Psychiatric Disorders by psychiatrist Ralph Walton, MD. We know that in a variety of psychiatric disorders, there is a disturbance in the balance of brain, uh, in the balance of certain neurotransmitters, specifically serotonin, norepinephrine, Dopamine and acetylcholine are all major players. Aspartame can affect the levels and balance of all these neuro, all these transmitters. It impairs the absorption of L-tryptophan and the, the major precursor in the synthesis of serotonin. It can both produce and aggravate depression. In certain patients, it can trigger manic episodes. It can produce or aggravate panic attacks. Some of my patients have experienced a complete cessation of panic attacks and needed no further treatment after they completely eliminated aspartame from their diet. Certain schizophrenic patients have experienced few, fewer auditory hallucinations and needed less antipsychotic medication after the elimination of aspartame. It is essential that there be much greater awareness of the hazards of this highly toxic substance. Flavor enhancers. Again, there's many different flavor enhancers and flavorants, but I'm only going to read a quote about monosodium glutamate or MSG. Could dietary glutamate play a role in psychiatric distress? Published by the National Library of Medicine. While glutamate is an endogenous amino acid, the bound form can also be obtained from dietary sources such as those found in meat and the free form can be found in food additives like monosodium glutamate, MSG, as well as soy sauce and Parmesan cheese. Although the US Food and Drug Administration has designated MSG as gen generally recognized as safe, dietary intake of MSG has been associated with somatic stress distress among both healthy controls and individuals with chronic pain conditions. In addition to glutamate's association with somatic distress such as pain, pain sensitivity, physical weakness and fibromyalgia symptoms, glutamate has also been associated with psychiatric distress. Specifically, central nervous system glutamate dysregulation has been associated with symptoms of anxiety, post-traumatic stress, obsessive compulsive disorder, mania, depression and psychosis with the strongest evidence for glutamate's role in schizophrenia. In addition to anxiety, trauma and obsessive compulsive symptomatology and disorders, glutamatergic dysregulation has been demonstrated in mood disorders across 
both bipolar and depressive disorders. Colorants. Um, I'm going to read a quote on tartrazine, which is the yellow food colorant. The potential health hazard of tartrazine and levels of hyperactivity, anxiety-like symptoms, depression, and antisocial behavior, published by the Journal of American Science. The role of tartrazine in modulation of depression response has been formally outlined in children where ingestion of tartrazine showed clinical, clinical depression, migraines, and sleep disturbance. In, in addition, November et al., reported two cases of unusual reactions to food additives, tartrazine and benzoates, involving mainly the central nervous system, headaches, migraine, overactivity, learning difficulties, and depression. Tartrazine has been found to diminish the ability of vitamin B6 to function in critical biochemical pathways such as tryptophan, serotonin, metabolism. The results reported herein potentially suggest that re the re relevance of tartrazine in inducing harmful effects, especially on behaviors related to anxiety and depression. The study also gives insight into the potential hazard of long-term exposure to currently food-permitted colorants with increased incidence of psychological disorders and its comorbidity impact on human health. Preservatives. Again, there's different types of preservatives, but I'm only going to read a quote about sodium benzoate. Sodium benzoate, harmfulness and potential use in therapies for disorders related to the nervous system, published by the National Library of Medicine. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or ADHD, is mainly associated with symptoms of hyperactivity, inattention and impulsivity. Beverages containing benzoate preservatives in their comp composition were given 45 milligram per day to three-year-old children who then experienced an increase in hyperactivity. These behaviors were reduced after the withdrawal. Another study showed a similar, similar effect of sodium benzoate in eight, nine, and three-year-old children. Furthermore, a survey was conducted among college students that examined the association between consumption of sodium benzoate rich beverages and symptoms associated with ADHD. Thus, it was shown that the consumption of such beverages was associated with a higher prevalence of symptoms of ADHD. Okay, so that's it for the food additives. And then obviously, substances such as alcohol, nicotine, recreational substances, um, they all um, deplete neurotr neurotransmitters as well. Then that was nutrition and then obviously there's exercise water sunshine temperance fresh air rest and trust in god i'm not going to go into detail of all of those but exercise is 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 a is a natural antidepressant because of the endorphins that it releases and all the other other points there are also very important if you want to recover from mental illness now we get to the spiritual side I'm going to read a quote from the great controversy. Evil spirits in the beginning created sinless were equal in nature, power and glory with the holy beings that are now God's messengers. But fallen through sin, they are leagued together for the dishonor of God and the destruction of men. United with Satan in his rebellion and with him cast out from heaven, they have through all succeeding ages cooperated with him in his warfare against the divine authority. We are told in scripture of their confederacy and government, of their various disorders and their intelligence and subtlety, <coughs> and of their malicious <coughs> designs against the peace and happiness of men. <coughs> so when we look at all the ways that um, Satan has found to weaken the prefrontal cortex through stress, through bullying, um, trauma, through diet, then obviously they are also going to be, uh, let's say, designs, like it says here, designs against the peace of happiness of men. 
in the spiritual realm um, to weaken the prefrontal cortex. So the first one is media and entertainment. Television. Telev television puts the viewer in an alpha state, allowing suggestions to be poured into the mind without critical thinking. Television also messes with the emotions, um, sadness, fear, anxiety, adrenaline. <clears throat> television can desensitize us to sin if we keep seeing, um, say, violent movies over and over, we become numb to violence. It also, TV um, causes lack of communication and bonding in the home. Dr. Ryan Doherty from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in Baltimore conducted a study of 599 American adults between 1990 and 2011 and found those who watched an above average amount of television had reduced gray matter volume in their frontal cortex and entorhinal cortex. Occult practices. Occult practices, whether we see them on television or whether we take part in them, um, invite evil spirits and they can affect our mental health and our well-being and our emotions. Mind-altering substances that not only affect the neurotransmitters in the brain, but they also invite evil spirits. <coughs> Video games. Following is a quote from the article Emotional Regulation in Young Adults with Internet Gaming Disorder, published by MP MDPI. People diagnosed with Internet Gaming Disorder have been frequently reported to experience depression, anxiety, and hostility. Emotional regulation contributes to these mood symptoms. The amount of time spent playing online games has been positively correlated with depressive symptoms. The association between internet gaming disorder, depression and hostility were also demonstrated in recent studies. Gentile et al. reported that internet gaming disorder could be a cause of depression in adolescents. Further, Taroki et al. also reported that compulsive internet use predicted poor mental health among ad adolescents in longitudinal investigation. These results might indicate that repeatedly excessive online gaming could contribute to emotional difficulties, possibly through impaired daily life functions or their negative consequences. Then uh, I'm also going to read a few quotes from uh, the article, How Gaming Affects the Brain. And that's from gamequitters.com. The prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex of the brain, which is responsible for decision-making, judgment, and self-control, does not fully develop until the age of 25. This can make young gamers less able to weigh up the pros and cons of immediate rewards, like another few hours spent gaming against long-term goals, such as revising for their math test next week. This may also explain why some young gamers neglect their basic needs such as food, sleep, exercise, and personal hygiene in order to continue playing video games. Researchers have found that violent games in particular can lower activity in developing brains. One study reported that young male gamers who spent many hours playing a violent video game for two weeks had lower activity in important brain areas when trying to control their behavior compared to adolescents who played no video games over that period. Another study of youth gamers found that playing violent video games for just 30 minutes immediately lowered activity in the prefrontal cortex compared to the brains of those who played non-violent video games. Amygdala. Our natural fight or flight response is designed to protect us when we sense danger. The body releases hormones that increase our heart and breathing rates and gets our muscles ready to respond. In some situations, it can be a lifesaver by helping us stay focused, alert, and able to react quickly. However, there is a point at which the fight or flight response stops being beneficial and starts causing problems. This can happen when playing violent video games. Over time, the brain may think the threats and attacks are real and the game is actually a battle. This can cause the player to react angrily and aggressively. 
So if you have ever wondered how violent video games affect the brain differently, it is the fight or flight amygdala that has taken over so the player cannot access the logical part of their brain. Internet. Following is a quote from the article, Decreased Frontal Lobe Function in People with Internet Addiction Disorder, published by the National Library of Medicine. Internet addiction disorder is defined as the inability of an individual to control his or her use of the internet. This inability eventually causes psychological, social and work difficulties and even physical and mental disorders. Music. Um, when I used to struggle with bipolar type 2, I could listen to one song and that one song could put me in a manic episode for three days. And I started to recognize this and then I stopped listening to music and it actually helped to reduce my manic episodes. Um, by the way, I don't have bipolar type 2 at all anymore. I haven't had a manic episode in, I don't know, three years or something. I do still struggle with the the borderline personality disorder symptoms sometimes because that's more a cognitive problem and the OCD is also more cognitive so I'm still working on them but they've improved a lot through these um, strategies. Um, there is an online series presented by Christian Birdall called Distraction Dilemma and um, that's got more information on music and how it affects the brain and how certain types of rhythms um, can invite evil spirits. So it's also linked on my website on the resources page. Then books, magazines and other reading material can also um, create open doors for e evil spirits if we read the wrong material. Then there are other, other factors that can create open doors and invite evil spirits to affect our mind. Um, sin is one of them uh, the bible says behold the lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear but your iniquities have separated you from your god and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear that's isaiah 59 verse 1 to 2 um sin the definition of sin is sin is the trans transgression of the law 1 john 3 verse 4 and the law being the Ten Commandments. God says, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. John 14, verse 15 to 18. Also, when we keep the Ten Commandments, God also um, gives us the, the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit has um, a certain influence on the mind. For example, here it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Galatians 5, verse 22 to 23. Purity. Um, any, any behaviors that involve impurity will also block God out because it's the same as sin. A need for forgiveness. Um, if sin separates us from God, then confession and forgiveness reunite us with him. God says, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. If we confess our sins he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness 1 john 1 verse 9 for i will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will i remember no more hebrews 8 verse 12 a lot of the times when we've done things that are wrong especially if we um, struggle to control our behavior we hold on to the guilt and that guilt fuels the amygdala and keeps the stress response switched on and fuels this, you know, mood problem. We must let go of guilt. If we ask God to forgive us, we must let it go. A need to forgive. 
For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Matthew 6 verse 14. Um, it, it's important for our mental health as well. If, if, if somebody has hurt us, to let it go and to forgive the person. Because otherwise it's going to make us unhappy. Denial. Denial prevents God from fixing what is wrong within us. We need to admit our sins and our mistakes and our faults to God. Lack of Bible reading. Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Matthew 4 verse 4. And prayer. But Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. And Jesus is our example. So we need to pray to keep our mental health, um, to um, invite God's Spirit to help us with His Spirit of calmness and, and happiness. Luke 5 verse 16. Pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17. Lack of resistance against temptation. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. James 4 verse 7. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4 verse 13. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. Lack of willpower and effort. I'm going to read a quote here from the Ministry of Healing, page 173. Many have to battle against strong hereditary tendencies to evil, unnatural cravings, sensual impulses, were their inheritance from birth. These must be carefully guarded against. Within and without, good and evil are striving for the mastery. Those who have never passed through such experiences cannot know the almost overmastering power of appetite or the fierceness of the conflict between habits of self-indulgence and the determination to be temperate in all things. Over and over, the battle must be fought. We must use full power to overcome these problems that we are facing. And then I'm reading from the Review and Herald. Angels are ever present where they are most needed. They are with those who have the hardest battles to fight, with those who must battle against inclination and hereditary tendencies, whose home surroundings are the most discouraging. Lack of assertiveness. We need to say no to peer pressure and manipulation and to sin. Lack of thought control. We have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 16, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5, whatever, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Philippians 4 verse 8. Lack of emotion control. Fears. God says there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. 1 John 4 verse 18. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. Anger. Be angry and do not sin. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Ephesians 4 verse 26. And sadness. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8 verse 28. Lack of behavior control. So then, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Ephesians 5 verse 15. To walk circumspectly means to consider all circumstances and possible consequences by using the prefrontal cortex. Believing lies, as we discussed before, um, Satan not only lies to us about who we are, but he also lies about who God is and he lies about doctrines. There are so many false doctrines out there and believing lies can block God out and invite evil spirits. So there's a um, series on my website on the resources page called total onslaught and you can go and have a look at that series and that talks about biblical doctrines and so on confusion 
the vague and fanciful interpretations of scripture and the many conflicting theories concerning religious faith that are found in the Christian world are the work of our great adversary to confuse minds so that they shall not discern the truth. The Great Controversy, page 520. Um, Satan likes to confuse us about who we are, our identity, about God. Um, we really need to seek the truth in the Bible and to pray for clarity when we feel confused about things. Lack of trust and faith in God. If you lack faith, I would recommend that you read the book of Job. And um, there's a verse, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord del delivers him out of them all. Psalms 34 verse 19. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Philippians 4, verse 6 to 7. Lack of hope. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope. Lack of purpose. I will cry out to God most high, to God who performs all things for me. Psalms 57 verse 2. Um, some of the other translations say, um, I will cry out to God most high who fulfills his purpose for me. Lack of altruism. If you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness and your darkness shall be as the noonday. Isaiah 58 verse 10 to 11. Lack of love. God is love. 1 John 4 verse 8. So when Jesus was on the earth, he um, characterized the Ten Commandments, which is a law of love, into two commandments. The first four commandments are about love for God, and the last six commandments are about love for one another. He said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Matthew 22, verse 37 to 38. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Matthew 22, verse 39 to 40. So if we, he also says, thou shalt not have any um, gods before me and also no idols. But idols are not just um, images that we bow down to. An idol can be anything that is in the home that's placed above God. And if God is love, it means anything placed above love. So, for example, if we just watch television um, and we ignore each other and we don't, love each other that's an idol in the home there's a there's a video on my website called american idolatry that's a good one to go and watch if you want to um, understand more about modern forms of idolatry lack of empathy finally all of you be of one mind having compassion for one another love as brothers be tender-hearted be courteous 1 P peter 3 verse 8 Lack of support. Um, in my life, I experienced that having mental illness does not offer the support that we actually need. And we actually receive the opposite treatment. You know, if somebody is in hospital with heart failure or kidney failure or liver failure, um, people are more understanding and more supportive. And they send messages to each other to pray for this person because they're in hospital. Um, but when a person is struggling with mental health problems, it's not the same. It's more like people gossip about the person because they're in a psychiatric ward. So there's, there's a big problem there with stigma and um, people having no empathy or understanding for people who struggle with mental illness. Lack of connection. I'm going to read a piece here from Luke 10 verse 38 to 42. Jesus entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she approached him and said, Lord, 
Do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. So the way I understand that verse is that um, Martha was very uh, focused on the actual work and Mary found the connection that is the good part that, that God or Jesus spoke about here. Um, lack of connection is is a problem in many homes and I believe that the television and all these modern forms of entertainment are, are largely to blame but it can also be that we place too much focus on work. Even in, in ministry you can focus more on the work and, and forget about love and connection. So I think that was what Jesus was trying to point out here. Then lastly, the presence of fallen angels that can also affect our mental health and state of mind. I'm reading here from Review and Herald, um, August 3rd, 1886. Satan will, if he is unsuspected, give feelings and impressions. Then the Bible says, be sober, be watchful because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5 verse 8. Then there's another quote here from Testimonies, volume 1, page 345. If Satan sees that he is in danger of losing one soul, he will exert himself to the utmost to keep that one. And when the individual is aroused to his danger and with distress and fervor, looks to Jesus for strength, Satan fears that he will lose a captive and he calls a reinforcement of his angels to hedge in the poor soul and form a wall of darkness around him that heaven's light may not reach him. But if the one in danger perseveres and in his helplessness cast himself upon the merits of the blood of Christ, our Savior listens to the earnest prayer of faith and sends a reinforcement of those angels that excel in strength to deliver him. Satan cannot endure to have his powerful rival appear to, for he fears and trembles before his strength and majesty. At the sound of fervent prayer, Satan's whole host trembles. He continues to call legions of evil angels to accomplish his object, and when angels all-powerful, clothed with the armory of heaven, come to, help, to the help of the fainting pursued soul, Satan and his host fall back, well knowing that their battle is lost. And this, this quote it explains the, the spiritual battle that we are sometimes not aware of. And I have experienced exactly this kind of battle in, in my mind um, when there were times where I, I felt like um, reverting to self-destructive behaviors. You know, uh, when you're in a very, very bad depression episode, you can be tempted to do things that can lead to... Um, the loss of your own life, you know, and it was this quote that helped me to understand how Satan really comes and attacks the mind and that we need to pray and not just give up after praying one line and seeing, oh, well, it's not helping because this is the kind of battle that's going on. We need to keep praying and keep praying until Satan's power has been broken. Then there's just one last thing that I want to say here. Um, the Bible says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, verse 32. And the truth is defined in the Bible through the verse, Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. John 17, verse 17. Um, the truth in the Bible is not only the truth about the God and the doctrines, but it's also the truth about you, about who you are, your value. Um, and um, this is the truth that will set us free. If we know the truth about who we are, that we are valuable, that we are loved, that God loves us and that he died for us to save us, this is the truth that will set us free. We must remember that it's our beliefs that, call, that create our thoughts, our feelings and affect our body and our behavior. So yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tanya. 
Um, I'm sure we were all very blessed with um, the presentation. You said you're not very academic, but you had very um, academic terms explained <laughs> in very simple ways that all of us can understand, even if we haven't had the education necessarily. So, um, yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense. And it makes sense as well that um, you touched on the mind, body and spirit um, aspect. So it makes sense that um, God has created us as intellectual, physical and spiritual beings. Mm -hmm. So all those aspects, I guess, need to be touched. And um, if there is any void in any of those areas, then, yeah, that needs to be yeah. fixed. So you obviously spoke about the outbursts of anger and that can come from depression or um, any other mental health struggles. Um, mm. I find it important to understand, uh, especially for people that don't struggle with those uh, mental health issues, that the people that act in those um, explosive or angry ways, they don't do it out of um, selfish motives necessarily, um, mm. but that a lot of the time it is a cry for help is that right yeah, yeah exactly and uh, a lot of the times it's because whatever triggered them has has pressed on a core wound a really really sore deep wound um, and that's why the reaction is so strong as I was listening, I also thought of animals that are rescued, if it's a suitable example, I guess, animals that are rescued, a lot of the times they seem aggressive. So if you don't know what that can be a result of, you can actually be scared of them or something, but that's actually because they have suffered some type of um, trauma. So they need more love and they need to get used to you. Exactly. Yeah, I, I rescue animals myself um, and um, I've noticed that the one at, um, kitten that I got, she was eight weeks old and she was the one that I got at the earliest age and she is securely attached to me. And it's just, it was interesting for me to see that the animals also have these attachment styles that we have. She can go out and go and play and she'll come back for some love and food and then she'll go out and play. Whereas the other one that that are the other cat that I took in, she was seven months old already, and she had a lot of traumas on the street, and she is um, clingy. She's got the clingy attachment style. She's always following me everywhere. She doesn't even want me to work. If I sit at my desk, she's got these big eyes, you know, <laughs> staring at me. If she wants me to go and sit on the floor with her, so uh, that was quite interesting. <laughs> Yeah, so it's really important to understand um, the attachment styles that you mentioned as well and the five love languages too. Like you said, like just because someone's love language is by um, service or doing things for you, that doesn't mean that they don't love you just because they don't sit on the couch and spend time with you. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you touched on um, a very important point and I'm just surprised as I listened to your testimony about your teacher as well. I'm just surprised because obviously nowadays it seems to be quite the opposite. Obviously you don't have teachers that hit you and everything, but I just wonder like um, what education do teachers get if the psychological part and emotional part is not involved in their studies? Um so how they can yeah like yeah I, I when i was younger i was living in that time when it was still allowed for boys what they called cuts to receive cuts you know um slashes with a, a rod was still acceptable in that time um i'm not sure really what the laws were about hitting girls but it wasn't it wasn't that dramatic but it was it was embarrassing for me to be hit on my back with a ruler because I'm too dumb to understand my work. <laughs> so yeah, it, it affected me it really did. Yeah, and it reminds me of when I changed schools all of a sudden, like I was quite depressed and anxious and I just remember that I wouldn't understand chemistry, whereas I was okay, you know. 
at chemistry like in the other school in previous school and I started getting really bad marks and uh, it would be really good for teachers I guess to understand what stress can do to the brain that you will literally not even understand the subject and it's yeah. not because you're dumb but um, yeah, yeah direct I, I, stress. it took me a long time to to drop the belief that I was dumb <laughs> um, <laughs> and I also started to understand more about aptitude you know we didn't have aptitude tests in my school and there wasn't even any art classes and I'm an artistic person when I was in in uh, Germany visiting there I I learned that they had three different types of schools they had the academic school the technical school and the art school and if we had those three schools available in South Africa I would have definitely been in the art school for sure but now I was in, in the academic box trying to be academic when it just wasn't mm -hmm. part of my personality it doesn't mean i'm dumb it just means it's not my field yes very true um and also you mentioned that mental health is not visible the struggles are not visible that's why we don't get the same support and you're absolutely right about how we get actually the opposite because yeah. i've heard this from people that are actually very close to me that you can just get over it. You just have to get over it because it's confused with just acting out and just choosing to be angry where in actual fact that's um, that's not the case. And um, one time I even mentioned to my husband when I think it was about not wanting to be sociable and I mentioned to my husband, I said, you can't expect a person that's limping to run as fast as you. So you shouldn't expect that I have to socialize as much as you um, exactly. just because you don't see what's happening in my mind. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, people can, can be um, unaware of the battles and the struggles going on in a person's mind and it's constant you know like for example mm -hmm. my social media if 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 i sit around a table and i eat with people i swallow my food whole because i can't even i can't even chew my food i'm so nervous and they can't see that only i know it <laughs> unless they know unless i told them yes true um, obviously, in our next meeting, I'll talk about um, my anxieties and um, issues as well. But um, when you talk about what you go through, it's um, it's very familiar. I know how I used to be a lot worse with that, like not being able to eat. I remember when we first started talking with my husband online, I couldn't eat in front of him and I couldn't explain <laughs> why. <laughs> it's the same as me. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it happens mm -hmm. and it's real. So um, I have a few questions um, to conclude the uh, presentation. Okay. Um, so I just want to ask you, Tanya, again, as I heard your uh, testimony, you mentioned that kids would make fun of your diet so what about religion because you had just gone from atheism to christianity um would they make fun of your religion as well mm. i don't re really remember being bullied about the actual religion it was more the diet and my appearance and who i was as a person although mm -hmm. you know it wasn't really um I didn't really reveal much about who I was as a person because I was quite quiet and shy. So for me, it, it was it was a spiritual attack because there was no reason to bully me in that way. So I saw it as a spiritual problem, at least later mm -hmm. on. But yeah, I don't yeah. know why the religion itself wasn't really attacked. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Which takes me to my next question, which is, um, did you question your religion and beliefs? Did you think maybe you are in the wrong group? Maybe that's not the church or in general, you should not be going to a church that it is a sect perhaps. Yeah, I did. I had a lot of um, periods in my life where I um, doubted whether I was in the right religion and whether I was inviting all these experiences because I'm in the wrong religion but 
I, I'm not somebody who just believes something because I'm told to believe it. I actually did my own studies and I found, I, I read the whole Bible from the beginning to the end and I'm not even a good reader, <laughs> but um, I searched for the truth myself and I was um, established in my own beliefs to know that I'm in the right place. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. And um, you talked about your childhood, obviously, and how at the age of seven you already were questioning. So how far back do your memories go in your childhood? And um, obviously, do you have, do you remember your childhood as um, pleasant and bright? Like, what's your favorite part of your childhood? Um, the, the time from when I was born until the age of seven, are like the happiest times of my whole life. I think my memories go back to about maybe the age of four and a half, somewhere around there. Um, and I only have positive memories. I, I mean, there are a few little things here and there that, that weren't so nice, but mainly it was just a happy life. And um, a lot of the times when I was in the depression phase, I would long back for, for that time of my life. But um, I think it was worth it to go through what I went through because I, I learned things, you know. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I can understand that because I have been like that since I was 14. Um, I did definitely go back to my childhood in my head a lot of the times when I was depressed. And, um, yeah, I remember that part of my childhood actually up to the age of 14 as um, very bright and very positive. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, Tanya, you talked about uh, diet and supplements as well. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, probiotics? Do you take them? Do you think they help with gut health and mental health as well, obviously? Yeah, definitely. Um, I did do um, a course of, of probiotics, but now the, the, the product that I mentioned earlier also has probiotics in it. So I'm only using that one product for now, but definitely probiotics are important to help repair the gut, which then, you know, the gut affects the brain. So it's very, very important to heal the gut. Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely. So what about uh, low self-esteem? Obviously, you talked about how it can come from trauma and how sometimes we are made to believe that we are, um, we don't look good or we are, you know, we're not as intellectual as um, we would like to be. Uh, but do you think at some stage in our lives, can that be corrected? Can that become a mindset that, yes, we are good enough and that God loves us or it's a constant um, struggle perhaps all our lives? Um, it can definitely be improved. Uh, if I compare my self-esteem now, com uh, um, with how I was when I was 13, it's a huge improvement. There are some uh, moments where I will still feel like I'm not good enough or I'm ugly or, or something like that. But when I bring my thoughts back to, to um, my strategy, which was to look at who God created, you know, I am a created being. God created me with a purpose. He, he gave me certain talents and certain gifts. And so if you focus on your personal talents and your personal gifts and your strengths, then you, you um, improve your self-esteem. Basically, mm -hmm. understanding who you are in God has improved me. And also not worrying about what other people say about you. There are so many people who say mean things about me. Um, I hear about what other people say about me people warn people to stay away from me because I'm crazy or they tell someone to leave me because I'm crazy or they say how can you love someone like her and I just let it go you know I know who I am in God God created me and if somebody has the love of God in their soul they will not say things like that about another person because Jesus would never say that about somebody else because he created you that's true and um, that reminds me as well when my kids argue sometimes and um, my daughter says, well, she's obviously older than um, 
the the little one so there is like three years difference between them my son and my daughter and my daughter says I'm stronger than him and I say yes and strong people don't hurt the other person strong people lift each other up so yeah. she says oh okay I'll help him that's a good answer yeah yeah, yeah. So, and sometimes when it comes to, I guess, anxiety and um, social phobias even, uh, sometimes there are things that we don't have control over, like the recent um, restrictions, obviously, that were imposed on us that we couldn't socialize properly and um, we were actually made to think that the other person even could be sick and um you know it makes us extra cautious and extra nervous about what the other person can do to us perhaps or even pregnancy stress i've heard um uh, different studies about how pregnancy stress can affect the fetus and how the fetus can already be born be with certain um, predisposition um, so yeah unfortunately we don't have control over all the um you know, environmental factors, but I guess there are things that we can do to improve, as you said. Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually forgot to mention about the isolation. Um, they did some studies and found that isolation um, deteriorates your myelin sheath, and that's the, the insulation around your nerves, your nerve fibers. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so you can develop all sorts of uh, symptoms from that. And when you are reintroduced to socializing, it actually, it improves again. So isolation mm -hmm. is very bad for mental health. Yes. So even if you are naturally um, an introverted person, you still have to socialize. Is that right? Yeah. We, we are created to socialize. And um, it's yeah. okay if you want to socialize less than other people that's but but don't completely isolate yourself because then it's you, you don't have the activity in your brain to stimulate growth you know what i mean mm -hmm. mm. yes absolutely so about bullying so you talked about obviously bullying and how it has um, obviously affected you so do you think obviously now being older and being more mature we can think uh, back and think that um, i should not have let it affect me um, do you think that the bullies need more help or as much help as the ones that are being bullied yeah, I, I think both actually need help because it's often the case that children who bully other people have problems at home. Um, perhaps there's violence in the home. Perhaps they feel unloved at home. Perhaps they're being broken down um, and they feel the need to break somebody else down to feel better about themselves. So they also need counseling. Um, mm -hmm. Also, I did some studying into how a person should react when when you're being bullied and my mistake was that I showed people that I was affected by it because then they're going to carry on with it and I what I should have actually done was completely ignore them as if they don't exist um, and then strengthen my own self-esteem at home um, by looking at my own strengths and qualities and and you know the love that God has for me and my family has for me. So yeah, I, I that was my fault that I reacted in that way that made them want to be willing me even more. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in that case, would you say it's quite important to teach the kids, um, your own kids like that potentially could be bullied or could be bullies at school? Um, do you think like it's quite important to educate them in, I guess, both sides? Yes, yeah, because otherwise they're going to develop faulty beliefs about who they are and then they're going to develop negative thoughts, uh, feelings. Their body is going to be affected by the anxiety. Their brain chemicals are going to be affected and then their behavior. They might start using substances to um, to kill the pain. And, and so, yeah, it's very important. Yes, and obviously talking to the parents or having that safe 
circle that they can discuss these things with. I think it is quite important as well that the parents are quite um, open um, for the kids to communicate with them. Yeah. So um, are you sometimes grateful for mental health struggles, Tanya? Because in my case, I know that sometimes I am kind of happy that I have even physical um, struggles, that that makes me like learn and study more about it. Definitely. Um, since, mm -hmm. since I've started experiencing symptoms, I developed a desire to help other people who have the same symptoms because I saw that um, most people don't get it, <laughs> you know, they, they expect you to just come right or just get over it or just toughen up. And it's a lot more involved than that. And it, it caused me to study really intensely into what mental illness is. And I wouldn't have known anything about it if I didn't have it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so how would you say we could avoid um, friction in the family, whether it be husband and wife or um, kids and parents? How can we um, stop these uh, mental health conditions interfering with our relationships, whether that be anxiety or feeling of unloved? Um, I, I think open communication is one of the keys. Um, like, for example, my parents, they, they've learned to listen to my needs and my feelings um, and to not be affected by it too much if I have like an anger outburst or something to, you know, that is the end result of that whole cognitive behavioral therapy cascade to rather go to the beginning and to, to try and understand what is the core wound here and what are the beliefs here, what are the thoughts, what are the feelings that are leading me to have this freak out <laughs> and this anger outburst and, and that really helped me so to try and um, understand what the person is really truly feeling inside and not to focus too much on on the bad behavior because if you reprimand somebody for their bad behavior you're actually pushing them further away and um, encouraging them to have worse behavioral outbursts mm -hmm. And I guess depending on the kid's age, perhaps they could go to someone else and you don't really want that. Yeah. If you have young kids, they might actually find um, comfort in someone else, whether that be auntie or, you know, someone they shouldn't exactly be sharing those struggles yeah. with. Yeah. So, so I think if they feel understood, that already um, solves a big problem. You know, people want to feel understood. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how about um, those times when I'm sure it has happened to a lot of people when we call a loved one, I call my husband and he's not answering and I know that um, this is the time when he should be home and all sorts of things start going through my mind, what's, what's happened to him, you know, has something happened to the car, did something happen to, uh, to him, like how can we stop that? I also struggle with that um, and they call it catastrophizing um, or mm -hmm. separation anxiety can also um, be a part of that. Uh, so for me, when I start to catastrophize, like say if somebody doesn't write back to me, I will immediately jump to the worst um, case scenario, like, you know, something happened to them or they decided to leave me or whatever the worst thing is in my mind and so to help balance that out i found a way to look at what is the worst okay scenario what it what, what is the worst thing that could happen what is the best thing that can happen and what is most likely the thing that is happening um so that you can broaden your perspective so say for example okay he's not answering the worst case scenario is something bad happened to him or he, he left me. Um, the best case scenario is that I don't I can't think of something really, but say um, he is picking out a, a venue for us to have a special occasion or he's just around the corner. And then the most likely one is he's probably um, probably 
on a call or probably in a business meeting or something and that's why he can't answer right now so the, try and try and bring your thoughts back to a more rational way of thinking and in the, in the middle ground rather than the two extremes you know what i mean that's the best way mm -hmm. that i deal with that, deal with that um catastrophizing mm -hmm. very good okay um so tanya you mentioned obviously from we can tell from your testimony and um the the scientific um, quotes and everything that mental illnesses can overlap and um what would you say is it a good idea to get diagnosis because uh, sometimes we might be embarrassed um, we don't want to have that on file that we have some type of mental health issue but would you say it's good to have an official diagnosis for me um it was necessary to have a diagnosis because i had so many different symptoms it was like one big mess in my head you know the one moment i'm very very depressed the next moment i'm running around <laughs> all over the place and i'm eating two main meals at a restaurant and feeling too embarrassed to order a third one so i go to another restaurant the next moment i have a paranoia episode and it was just too much going on so for me it, it made sense to know okay these are the symptoms of that disorder those are the symptoms of this disorder mm -hmm. Um, so that I can start understanding what symptom I'm having when I'm having some kind of an episode. And I can say, okay, this is bipolar. It's my bipolar that's being active right now. Well, this is the BPD, the borderline being active right now. Then I can deal with that symptom a lot easier. A uh, problem uh, defined is a problem half solved. So if we can define what our problem is, then we can solve it. Mm hmm and would you say if someone is um, suffering with anxiety or depression, the situations that put us in that uh, state of mind, do you think it's a good idea to purposefully put us in those situations? Like if we have social anxiety, do you think like exposure is a good therapy or um, avoiding triggers is actually going to be better? Um, both. <laughs> um there is a, a treatment called systematic desensitization and that's where you challenge your anxiety and you use relaxation techniques at the same time so that it's not too overwhelming um, and that's the method that I'm using to overcome my anxiety. My social phobia was so bad that I couldn't even go to a mall. I couldn't and, and because I was too scared somebody's going to approach me and then I have to speak to them and then I'm not going to be able to do that. So what I what I found, I accidentally did systematic desensitization when I applied for a, a um, sales representative job. Um, it was a medical sales rep job. And in the beginning of the job, I when I had to go and see doctors to... Um, uh, show them my products, you know, the medicines. I had such bad panic attacks <laughs> before I had to speak to the doctors. <laughs> and I was taking tranquilizers and I was crying and, you know, phoning people, I can't do this, I can't do this. And then I noticed after, say, three or four months, I was able to talk to doctors and show them my products without any panic attacks. I didn't even need the, the tranquilizers or anything. And that's what actually the desensitization um, is about. It's exposing yourself to the anxiety but in small steps in baby steps so that you don't overwhelm yourself um so that you can can unlearn that anxiety mm -hmm. yeah um a lot of people watching now might actually have uh, sound sensitivity or selective sound sensitivity disorder and we know that exposure therapy doesn't exactly work for us so I'll talk more about that in my um, testimony, obviously. But there are obviously certain conditions that people have reported that it it doesn't work. Like with anxiety, it is a very good idea what you mentioned. Um, but I just want to be clear that um, we are not including all, um, all situations. The yeah, all the no, no. triggers. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. There are things that I don't, I just don't expose myself to it. Um, mm -hmm. I just don't because it's going to have a negative impact on me. So if you feel like 
it's something that you just can't do, then avoid it, avoid that trigger um, and work on, on something else. It's exposing yourself to triggers that are easier to, to manage, you know what I mean, or to work on. You don't, mm -hmm. you don't have to push yourself to, to be triggered if you, if you don't want to. Mm -hmm. But as long as you don't become so isolated that you become sick mm -hmm. because of the isolation. Yes, definitely. So what would you say to people then if they may say, well, you're a vegan or you've got plant-based uh, lifestyle, you're a Christian, you should not have these mental health struggles, especially being exposed to the Bible and knowing the Bible promises and how God loves us and everything. Um, is that a guarantee that we are not going to struggle or Satan might actually attack those people even more? Um I have thought about this myself and um, I have a, a, an example. Um, a lot of the times, if you say, for example, you have an iron deficiency, people will say, oh, it's because you're vegan. <laughs> but mm -hmm. if you look at the world out there, how many people have an iron deficiency who eat meat and other animal products? So it, mm -hmm. it's not just to say that um, you, you are how can I say exempt of illnesses if you're vegan? It depends on on your your predisposition. You know what your weakness is in your body. Uh, certain experiences in your past could have made your your body weak at some point. For example, if you used substances, you ha might have a weaker liver. Um, if you inherited certain um, weaknesses, you might have a weak place. Um, but I have experimented with different diets myself because, you know, during times when I was confused about whether it's my diet, I, I went on a meat diet. <laughs> I ate eggs, I ate dairy, I ate meat and I got sicker. I, I, I mm -hmm. couldn't, my body couldn't handle it. And I definitely feel better on, on the plant-based diet than on, on an animal product diet. And my body is not perfect because I've been through so much stress and, and, other traumatic experiences that I haven't mentioned. So, um, yeah, it's it's difficult. It's a difficult question to answer, actually. But um, mm -hmm. I feel that the plant-based diet is the best for me. Mm -hmm. And um, I think also I've noticed that people tend to be more attentive towards vegans or plant-based or the ones that who uh, that claim they eat healthy they tend to watch them more closely and to see if something goes wrong then they tend to question well how come um, I know that recently there was a it was quite a well-known health educator that died all of a sudden and we don't know why that happened and um, she wasn't very old either and then when people I knew I'm gonna get that comment from someone that well there you go so much for that and yeah. um and no, i said you know, mm -hmm. yeah yeah and um i said you don't know what stresses they had in their lives because you can eat the best kind of food and um, exercise and everything but stress can deplete your body of um, vitamins and minerals and um yeah uh, mm. your healthy diet might not have that much effect because of that yeah no exactly um it, it, it's not a guarantee if you're plant-based that you're never going to have any health struggles it's, it's um we're following what god originally designed for our bodies and um, there's a lot of scientific evidence out there that animal products are linked to disease you know diabetes and cancer and things like that so there's enough um information out there to study it for for yourself to figure out what is the healthiest diet mm -hmm. and someone even told me they said you could be eating very healthy and you could still be hit by a car just like i can be if i don't eat healthy but i guess being a christian we know that it's a perfect design we are given the manual we should follow it yeah, the rest is not our problem yeah, yeah exactly yeah. Okay, so thank you very much, Tanya, for um, your testimony, for all the information that you shared with us. 
and um, all the questions that you answered for us as well. Um, we are, yeah, we were very blessed um, to have you with us. Um, so uh, we hope everyone, our viewers, benefited from this meeting. We hope that it will make everyone more inclined to ask for help when they are suffering and that they can identify the signs of someone else's suffering and hopefully either help them or direct them in the um, right direction. So thank you very much to you, Tanya, and thank you to our viewers as well. Thank you too. <laughs> Yeah, and if we can ask you to close with a word of prayer, please. Okay. Dear Father in heaven, thank you that we could come together today to discuss mental health. I pray for all the people out there who are struggling with these problems, struggling with their emotions and their behavior, and that you will send your spirit to, to teach them um, and to show them how to overcome their own personal struggles. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for that, Tanya. We are looking forward to seeing you again um, for our next meeting. Thank you very much. <laughs>